Alrighty, welcome back, folks, to Organizational Culture. In the second part of the lecture, what I'm going to be talking about is the the forms of organizational culture, the actual ways that we can see, smell, touch, hear, feel, what the ideology is and what organizational cultures can do. So let's take a look at our first form, symbols themselves. Now there are a lot of different types of symbols. The first type of symbols are objects. Objects can be logos, they can be licenses, they can be flags, and they can be uniforms. So, you know, I picked some of my, my the most entertaining ones I could think of. You know, when you, let's start with the notion of the uniform. Obviously, sports uniforms are easy, but even the colors, um, and, and really, even if you look at Matthew McConaughey, which is not tough to do, but if you look at what he's doing, he's doing the hook'em sign. And if you if you uh, know what the hook'em sign is, it's all about how you identify yourself as being a Longhorn. I was I was in the gas station the other day, and this guy looks at me with this big old goofy grin on and flashes hook'em. You know the the automatic response is oh hey hook'em, and you toss up your hand and 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 that's because you're identifying as both I as both being a part of that. When I back out, I saw that he was from Texas and had the little University of Texas logo on it. So he saw that on mine, I saw it on his, and we went from there. And that's also part of the logo, the little happy longhorn head. But this is how organizations become recognizable. This is how members identify each other in terms of the uniforms and the slogan. So, so what is it about, uh, but you know, you know, you can pick out a police officer, you can pick out a firefighter. It's because the uniform in and of itself is that, that important symbol of who it is. Our flags are the same way. The Scottish flag, uh, if you're not familiar with it, by the way, is what that is. But flags are an important component for our states, for our countries, you know, it is, it is encapsulating who, again, we think we are. Now, organizations sometimes have flags, that's not terribly common, but it's a nice way of showing that there's an object that signifies some big organization, some big group. Now, the Washington, D.C. license plate is probably my favorite license plate ever, but licenses or certifications are another symbol of something. You know, if you have a driver's license, it is the signif signification that you are trusted with a motor vehicle. In our organizations, we have licenses and certifications that we're, that, you know, we're authorized to do X, Y, and Z, and, and we carry this membership card around with us, or we provide our, <clears throat> our documentation. That's what we're talking about with licenses, that they're symbolic of our work. They're symbolic of who we are at some other level. And then from the organizational level, the most common type of symbol is the brand or the logo. You know, what what is good branding, but it's about helping other people outside of the organization to identify with who we are, those objects. So objects are an important part of, of seeing. Now... The question is, what do they mean? You know, what does it mean? And that's where you get the connection between the form and the ideology. So when I was at the uh, University of Wyoming, our colors were brown and gold. And this was meant to represent the earth and the sun and something that was that was that had a lot more meaning coming from the West and, and the importance of... of really the environment, but not in an, not in an eco-nerd kind of way, but in terms of the agriculture that was there, all of that kind of thing. So when you try and uncover the meaning behind these objects, that's where you start to identify the, the symbolism or the reference to the ideology that connects up with it. So ask the question, what does the logo mean? Is there a good reason for it? If there is, that's your element of culture that you're measuring there. A second form of culture are, are our settings. So this can be the way an organization is laid out. Furniture, 
the way an office looks. You know, if you look up at the picture on the upper, upper uh, right, if you were going to ask yourself, what kind of a person works in that office, what would you say? Is this the secretary who works in that office or is this someone important? How do we know? Well, look at the size of the chair, look at the size of the office, um, the computer screens, kind of the, the decor. The way everything is laid out is really telling us that this is an important person's place of work. So that communicates meaning. Likewise, you know, what I love is uh, this conglomeration, by the way, of McDonald's pictures. So McDonald's used to be symbolized by bright colors, bright, bold colors, um, the reds, the yellows, and fairly uncomfortable kinds of surroundings. The goal was to get you in, get you out, and get you through fast food. Well, part of McDonald's rebranding is that they're trying to bring out this cafe environment. So even though there's still clearly red there and inexpensive furnishings, it's meant to look and be more inviting because that's one of the ways that they're trying to keep up with the changing expectations. So our, the environment that we're in and how the spaces are organized tell us a lot about an organization and what they're about. That's one of the ways to to think of symbolism as well. Look at the settings in which things take place. And that's going to try and that if you can figure out what the they're trying to use space for, you can learn a lot about an organization. There's a lot of high tech organizations, for instance, that have very open work environments. They'll have couches, they'll have cubicles, they'll have game tables, things like that. And it's because there's a creative process. A lot of advertising companies also look the same because they're trying to get their employees to, to do the same, engage in a creative process. And sometimes that is working at your desk. Sometimes that's going and playing some skee ball for a while while you're, while you're brainstorming. Figuring out the character of an organization is very much about looking at its surroundings, those settings. A third type of symbol are the performers themselves. So Colonel Sanders is not just kind of the figurehead that, that was picked for Kentucky Fried Chicken, but he has really become the, the emblem of the company. So the same way that Dave Thomas has become the emblem of Wendy's, even after he sold it, he was still the person on their commercials until he passed away. So then we ask the question, how about a company in crisis? How about BP with Tony Hayward? You know, as, as Tony Hayward made a lot of gaffes, so the I'd like my life back, you know, and, and there's kind of the negativity surrounding him. What does he symbolize? And is that going to help BP recover in their from from the crisis? If the answer is no, then he's not a very good symbol for the company. If the answer is yes, then you keep them on. See, this is the way that we start to examine, you know, who who are the figureheads, the, who is the face of an organization, and what do they represent about that face of the organization? This is one of the arguments that organizations are using now as, as a reason that they check into your Facebook, and that they, that they start to investigate that you're not doing something that would make the organization look bad. Because in, in kind of a modern world, where there are a lot of paracrises, as Combs would argue, that uh, we have a situation that any person become, can become both an asset and a liability to an organization at any given point in time. And it's because what organizations have found over time is that their performers, no matter whether they're leaders or whether they're just members of the organization, represent them and their interests. And they're very concerned with what it is that they're representing. Now, we transition from the symbols to the actual ways that we communicate in an organization. Now, there are a lot of instances of jargon or slang. Every industry, every profession has its own set of, of jargon that it tends to use. You know, I say org com and someone outside of organizational communication that isn't terribly meaningful. 
hell, if I say organizational communication to someone outside of the field of communication, people are like, what, what's that? And so then I have to explain public relations or human relations, depending on how I, how I want to define that. So jargon and slang is about how an organization communicates internally. You know, if you're in the military, it's like the alphabet soup, the A V P T I you blah, 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 18 letters of forms. You know, the first year that I was at the Air Force Academy, it was pretty much alphabet soup. But all organizations have some kind of jargon or slang. It's really a way of separating people internally, people who belong, from people who aren't. You know, so some ex funny examples of jargon and slang in the broader culture. The new thing of fail. That fail is is sort of that new kind of, what is that? That's a total fail, man. It's communicating that that you just haven't done well, but it's it's such a weird way of saying it. Pish, for anyone who uh, knows a Scottish person, pish is an all-purpose phrase or word. It's not a phrase, good lord. An all-purpose word. Pish could mean um, total crap, which is a common usage. It could mean um, that you got pished, which was you were drunk. It could also mean urination. The Scottish are weird. And, and I say this as someone who's married to a Scotsman. But all depending on the context. So you figure out one definition, but because it's slang, it has a bunch more. You know, we certainly have a lot of those in, in American English as well. You know, top shelf, idioms, all of those kinds of things. These are examples of, of jargon and slang that, that you use when you're a member of a culture and that make perfect sense. Outsiders, though, are really easy to, to identify and determine because they don't use the jargon or the slang right. That's the hardest thing about coming into any new culture is using that jargon and slang effectively. A second type of language is really the paralanguage, gestures, signals, and signs. What do they represent in an organizational setting? You know, the, the football guy on, on the, the right, anyone familiar with American football knows that means goal. The salute or just a basic signification of what you are as an organization. Now, the open 24 hours is is not really that interesting, but but what is it that they that the salute connotes? What is it that the goal sign connotes? Sometimes it's just a shorthand. Sometimes there's a lot more there. Even the way that you salute, the precision, the the quality of a salute in the military makes a big difference. So what is it that, you know, fraternities and sororities have a handshake, the secret decoder handshake. But you can walk up to, if you're a member of the Kappa Delta sorority, you can walk up and identify who's a member by the handshake itself. Do I know how to do it? God, no. But my friends who are Kappa Deltas can. These are the types of things that, again, it's a lot of times it's about connoting who's in and who's out. Language, or the paralanguage in this case, is really an important component of identifying who is a member and who isn't. And one of the things that culture does through its communication, through its sort of sustained engagement, is it helps to create that sense of identity and identification with the organization. So it's not only something that that reveals some kind of underlying value, respect, or or accomplishment, or a function of the organization, but it also helps to separate the those who belong from those who don't. Now, songs, a lot of organizations don't have songs. Some do. Um, since I was on it, I was in a Texas mood today, apparently. But, um, but really what it is, is trying to put together what it means to be in an organization. So songs tend to be uh, reserved for groups that have a strong level of identification. My college debate team had a song. We we 
butchered, um, I will survive, and made it about debate. And so, you know, some 15, 16 years later, I still know it. And, and this is the type of thing. It's because it was fun. You know, we, we would sing it. We, uh, we, we wrote it for a bizarre competition, but it stuck. And all of the members of that particular team that I still am in contact with, the ones who wrote it that year, we all still remember the thing. You know, even if we don't all remember all of it, we have enough of it that it that it matters because that was part of who we were. So that's why national anthems matter to people. That's why fight songs in college. That's that's what music does. You know, certainly as we develop um, beyond sort of an oral tradition and oral culture, we don't have as much of a place for songs, but this used to be one of the major modes of transmitting culture from from the the older generations to the younger generations was that you learn the songs of your culture. Now, if you look at sporting culture in, say, Great Britain with soccer or proper football, as it should be called, um... The fans who go to the games, they all know this, the songs. They all sing the same songs. You have 15, 20,000 people all singing the same song, and that is passed down and is part of a strong identification. So where songs exist, they're usually an indicator of a particularly strong culture. So they not only communicate the ideology, but again, it's about identification. Another form of culture that can sometimes be a bit destructive, but you can certainly learn a lot about an organization, is by looking at its humor, gossip, and rumors. So to the extent that you can ask someone, tell me the story, tell me what it means to be in your organization, another avenue that you can get to the same kind of information is to look at the kind of jokes that people tell. What the grapevine tells you, the, the rumor that goes on, you know, and this is one of those challenges in organizations. You're never, ever going to wipe out organizational gossip and rumor. But whether this is, this is about personalities or about kind of the bigger picture of the organization matters a lot. You know, there are, there are a lot of times when organizations internally have to confront and deal with a bunch of rumors going around um, in order to either conform or deny them because the rumors themselves can be damaging. Yet, strategically, rumors and gossip can be a really effective way to get information about potential policy changes before they're put in place. So you can send opinion leaders out with some information. What would it be if we blah, blah, blah. And those opinion leaders say, hey, you know what I heard? And you can actually get good information. If if you really want to know what what what's what in an organization, you pay attention to the gossip and to the rumors going around internally. Now, we also have, with the advent of the blogosphere, the whole world of rumor and gossip outside of organizations as well. So this creates a unique challenge for organizations because it's not only internally that they're managing and dealing with issues of humor, gossip, and rumor, but they're also having to contend with a whole new world of it on the outside. So the language and how people refer to their organization and what people joke about and what people talk about on their happy hours, that makes a lot of difference in terms of understanding what it really means to work and be in an organization. You know, th this is where you see the greatest disconnect between what the organization says that it does and what the organization really does, is when you start to look at some of the, what, what is often termed the darker side of culture. But it's an important piece of information as well that you d uncover about organizations. And then there are metaphors. You know, what is it that the organization stands for? Sometimes these are, are formal metaphors. 
Sometimes it's the imagery. Sometimes it's the feeling. So do you work in an organization where you actually feel like a family? That's an important question to ask. You know, this is something that um, the Cheney et al. book addressed in the very first chapter that we read. So what does it mean to be in our organization? Well, this is something that's really valuable and definitely a form of culture. If you understand what it is that an organization tries to be, what are its operational metaphors, and, and then also what are the metaphors that people who actually work there use for it, Externally, what does the organization represent to people outside of the organization? So there's a lot of really nice work that can be done in understanding organizations and what they mean and their cultures in terms of metaphorical analysis. So have they lived up to their, their hopes, their desires? Are they what they say they are? Well, one of the reasons that there's a disconnection with a lot of organizations is that the metaphor that people want to apply to it may not work anymore. So this is another important feature of understanding organizational culture. And then the final component of, the f of language are slogans and proverbs. Now, like I mentioned in the first half about the Think Different logo from, from Apple, you ask the question when you look at a slogan or a logo, is this telling me some truth about the organization? Is this something that the organization is really about? Is it about being innovative in the case of Apple? Is it about producing the best quality razor and, you know, having David Beckham as your, as your face man for it? Is it about getting access to all of the things that you want at an inexpensive price. To what extent does this really reflect what the organization is about? Well, you have to look internally. But slogans and proverbs are used both internally and externally as a way of pitching what it means to be in the organization. So when you ask the question, okay, what does think different? What is that about? It's about innovation. Is innovation a fair way to describe Apple? That's a certainly, that's certainly a meaningful conversation to have and a meaningful question to ask. And that's connecting directly to their ideology. So these are the ways that language can connect to the ideology in pretty direct and pretty kind of easy to understand ways. But we also have a third form of culture, narratives. Now, Think of the narrative just as the stories that organizations tell, but there are a few different kinds of narratives. The first are the stories and the legends. You know, how does an organization tell the story of itself? You know, one of the things that we coded in our project was framing the organization. This is in a lot of ways what the organization is doing. It's telling the story of itself in a particular circumstance. So what you find is that organizations with a strong culture are able to control the story a lot more effectively. They are able to get everyone to buy into the particular stories in their organizations. Now, as a management tool, this is great. If you have a common set of stories that people actually tell and they repeat over and over, and it's the ones that reflect well on the organization, then you have a nice level of connection between your organizational ideology, and what people actually think about. That may not always be the case. You know, there are legends in every organization, and a lot of times they're negative exemplars too. But that can also be instructive. What shouldn't you do in an organization? Here's the quality of a narrative that means that it has a lot of social control. It tells a story in a way that is indisputable. If someone says, well, did that really happen? The response is, hey, that's the story I heard. And so it, it allows organizations to indirectly communicate norms, rules, and consequences in ways that they couldn't otherwise do effectively. Yeah, you all can read a syllabus. But talk to someone who's taken the class before if you really want to understand what the class is about. 
the same way when you enter a new organization talk to people who've already been there listen to the battle stories and you figure out what the organization's about pretty quickly so that's really the function of stories and legend it's not just about what we put out there for the public to see it's about constructing what it means to be in an organization you can find out a lot if people who do who interview well are able to figure out whether they would fit in an organization by getting you know f potential colleagues and potential bosses to tell them a couple of stories about the organization if you pay attention to the story you're going to get a lot more truth than the sales pitch on an interview but that's a really important component of it now there's not just these kind of basic who we are what we're about but there's other kinds of narratives as well one is a saga sagas are about major events um, when I did a, a, I did a consulting project with Applied Materials where we were putting together um, an event for people from the Austin office, the California office, and then their international offices, including the UK, Germany, Israel, Taiwan, China, and Japan. And this was not long after the Sarbanes-Oxley Act was put in place, which was the accounting legislation that made organizations, especially publicly traded ones, follow a whole new set of rules um, in response to the Enron situation. Well, as the accounting was bringing all of its people on board, what they had discovered a few years back when they were doing their first reviews to be compliant with this new legislation internally before they went to the rest of the company was that they had this had a woman who had been uh, siphoning off little bits of money here and there but because they didn't have the kind of accountability systems that the new legislation required the company in the accounting division had actually lost hundreds of thousands of dollars over the period of, of five or six years because they didn't have the checks in place so this was a way, and what was great about this story was that I was told about it within the first day that I was working with them. And then as they talked to other people, the our guests from the other Applied Materials locations, they told this story as a way of, of not just saying that, you know, we are going to comply with the legislation because we have to, but as a way of saying that we want to comply with this legislation because as we were adopting and and beginning to put put the uh, technology into place to to be compliant here's what we found so it was the story of the recovery and and the explanation of an episode that helps to put in 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 place changes so a lot of times you see sagas come after major organizational changes or major organizational crises and then the third type of narrative is the myth myths are great myths are often about how the organization was formed whose story gets told matters a lot with myths uh, these are great because you start to really get a sense at, at who controls the information. So the Facebook, the movie, what's interesting about the movie, if you've seen it, is that it, it tells really three different stories and sort of lets you come to your own conclusion about what really happened with how Facebook was formed and a lot of other things. But the people who tell those stories have their own version of it and that and that's what gets told in the movie and that's what's interesting about it is that the creation of the company or the organization is very much told from from the perspective of the winner right this is how what we've come to understand about history that history is typically told from the perspective of the conqueror so in the latter part of the 20th century we saw a lot of we saw a lot of history revised and added to by adding in voices that we had never heard before. Well, an organizational myth is a way of explaining how the organization came to light. There's usually tales of heroism in there and 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 wonderful 
rich detail about about how they struggled and how they came to be. Myths like a creation myth, like Greek Greek stories of Greek gods and goddesses, myths are great. Again, they're indisputable truths, but they reveal to you what is valuable to that culture, to the people at that time. So narratives, language, and symbols really are about identifying and connecting the organization with its values. But one of the easiest manifestations of, of what an organization really values is in the final form, practices. And there are a number of practices that come to be in organizations, sometimes um, by on purpose, by design and sometimes by accident. So one of the forms of, one of the types of practices are the rituals and the taboos. What do we do and what don't we do? So Ryanair, let me, let me tell you what Ryanair, this is an Irish discount airline that operates in Europe. I had the chance to fly on Ryanair this summer and we made our landing on the first leg that I flew with them and, uh, I get the the do, 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 off to the races thing scared the hell out of me because it was this moment of we're landing and I'm and then this very loud music comes on. But this is a ritual that they do every time they land on time. They play this this little cheering weirdness and and people laugh. People who are used to it just laugh. That's what's interesting about it is is that you come to expect this kind of thing. What do you do every morning when you get to work? What does your boss do every morning when they get to work? Those are the types of things that are interesting. Now, the other side of the ritual are the things we actively avoid or the taboos in the organization, the elephant in the room to to, you know, not so subtly explain the metaphor. What don't you talk about? Now, in some organizations, you definitely don't talk about your salary. In some organizations, that's public knowledge. So what is it that you are allowed to do that you do every day by mandate or just by practice? And what is it that you don't do? Really two sides to the same coin, but an important component of who organizations think that they are and what organizations want to be. A second type of practice are the rites and ceremonies involved with organizations. So the terrible haircut on Tim Tebow, Tim is that his first name? Anyhow, Tebow from the Denver Broncos. That's an initiation rite. You know, they had a bunch of young players come in this year and they got terrible monk haircuts. You know, the, these are the types of things that when done in good fun, it's a part of saying, hi, you're a member now. So there are rites and ceremonies of that mark a lot of different occasions and organizations. You know, some organizations have a lot more of these kinds of ceremonies than others. But it's a way of marking things that are important, either formally or informally. You know, so we have the rite of initiation with with Tebow, and then we have an, an ending rite, a graduation or a commencement speech with John Stewart. So You'll find that organizations, the, the degree to which they routinize rites and ceremonies, that they're a part of what goes on absolutely every time, tells you about what kind of an organization and what kinds of things are important to them. You know, most organizations have a way of kind of, of subtly um, messing with the new guy. A little bit of hazing that's involved. Done in good fun. It's not a big deal. The question is, what does that communicate about the organization? Is it something that's done in fun or is it something that gets a little bit, a little bit dodgy? So these are the types of things when you look at what goes on in an organization, you break it down in terms of the symbols that you can find, the language that's used, the stories that are told, and the practices, and you actually end up with a very nice picture of what an organization is. So then you do some digging to figure out what does this all mean, and that points you back to the substance or to the ideologies involved. This is where 
Trice and Bayer argued, you start to really uncover the truth about an organization. They weren't big into just believing what the organization said about itself. They wanted to look a little deeper. If you really want to find out what an organization values, what it believes, who they are, look for the forms. All right. Have a good one, folks. Talk to you next week.